Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's episode is a remastered version of one of the best interviews I've done to date. You're totally going to love it, and I promise you that I will not take your time to direct your attention to something that isn't absolutely stellar. So enjoy this episode. We've remastered it for you, and what this is doing is it's freeing up a little bit of time for me to finish the new book, and it's also making sure that you've seen the most important, most impactful, most useful content, because I believe really deeply with Bulletproof Radio that given that we're pushing 50 million downloads, the number of, of hours that are consumed just listening to Bulletproof Radio is more than 100 human lifetimes. That's kind of a big responsibility. So I'm not going to waste your time, not with numbers like that. So this is one of those interviews that you absolutely have to hear. Today's cool fact of the day is that a recent study found that your chances of remembering something is far greater if you see it or touch it versus only hear it. In this study, research participants had a difficult time remembering something they heard only four to eight seconds after hearing it. But if they could connect the sound with a visual or a tactile kind of stimulation, their recall increased. Now, this is why some spiritual traditions request that when people study their texts, the people move back and forth like this. It's actually because you're getting the nervous system activated while you're studying, so it sticks in your brain better. Today's guest is Peter Sage. He's an international serial entrepreneur, a world-class speaker, an executive coach who wrote his first book at 18 years old about physique. He wrote Lessons Learned from the Recession and Five Keys to Master Your Life. Not only that, he's the founder of Space Energy, which is a multi-billion dollar project to generate and transmit clean energy from space. A competition level bodybuilder, an ultra marathoner, and a member of the Dangerous Sports Club. Basically, this is a guy who knows how to kick ass. In fact, knows how to teach people how to kick ass because he's also a Tony Robbins certified trainer. Peter Sage, I hope that introduction did you justice. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. It's, uh, it's always interesting to hear how um, uh, d different facts of your life can, can be presented in, in certain combinations that make you sound better than you probably are. But yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> You're so welcome. Uh, in all seriousness, though, you are a guy who has a track record of outperforming at multiple things at the same time, which is one of the reasons uh, that I, I reached out to Brian Rose for an introduction to have you on the show. Uh, what do you do every day to perform so well? I mean, you're you're one of the upper echelon performers. What's your what's your trick? Uh, I appreciate that question. Actually, it's um, that there's no trick to it, and, and that's one of the challenges. If people think that there's a trick and they don't see themselves as a, as a magician, then <laughs> it kind of puts themselves out of the realm. And and there's this separation that occurs, whereby you you have the, the sort of guru itis. Or you have this, you know, well, it's okay for you because fill in the blank, but not for me because I don't fill in that blank. And, and so one of the first things that I'd, I'd invite people either looking or, or listening to this to, to understand is the fact that there's nothing special about me. I'm, I'm, I'm you probably out of the chair, uh, and maybe I've had the opportunity to, to do a few things or, or had a few levels of insights that some people may not have yet had the opportunity to have access to. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, address some of that here on, on, this, uh, on this show. But, but you know, there's no trick to what I do. There, there's no magic that is outside of the scope of, that anybody else can do. We, we all have natural predispositions. But if I was to uh, put down the fact that uh, or, or highlight some of the, the attributes that have allowed me the, the illusion of being um, a, a magician, uh, I would have to put it down to, to, to self-discipline when it comes to taking charge of my inner world. And as a result of that, my outer world appears to others to fall into place probably a little more than, than theirs. Uh, that, that would be the only thing. Now, yeah, so, so there is a... Um, how do I put it? Yeah, there, there is a, a discipline required and I spend most of my time in the morning uh, doing my morning practice whereby I stay centered, I do meditate, 
I do read positive, inspirational, personal developments, yeah, uh, self-improvement, yeah, texts. Yeah, I do visualize what it is that I want. Nothing that you know, anybody else that has the, the same basic nervous system, biochemistry, and, and somewhat probably matching limited intelligence that I have uh, you know, couldn't do. But it's consistency. So if I'm able to do that on a consistent basis, there's no magic to that. It's just the decision to be able to do it. Well, there's a decision to do it, and then there's the selection of what to do, which is a, a big problem. Like there are guys like Tim Ferriss who have mastered all these different techniques, and you clearly have a morning routine that's helped you to elevate you know, your inner world so the outer world matches, and a very elegant way of, of saying that. What does the routine look like? I mean, do you wake up at 5 a.m. and go for a run? Do you wake up at, you know, 10 a.m. and, you know, have a latte at the corner, you know, Starbucks? Like, how, how does the whole thing work, right? <laughs> I, I know out of those two choices, there's a lot of people that would like it to be the second one. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but no, you know, it's, you know, nature operates on, on two laws, growth and contribution. And so growth is inherent to challenge. Yeah, the the, the unchallenged person remains juvenile. And unfortunately, in today's world of instant gratification that is being pushed to us by so many different agendas, commercial and, and otherwise, it's very hard for people to get onto the positive side of the habit curve when it comes down to uh, willingly challenging themselves. And yes, that includes getting up earlier and, and making time um, not that you can manufacture time, but utilizing time more effectively than most people who would rather stay in bed because they went to bed late watching movies or don't have a, a self-discipline on, on diet that supports a higher level of energy. Now saying that, some people are naturally more morning-focused people and some are, are naturally more night-focused people. I, I'm a morning guy, so for me, my start is 6 a.m. at the latest. I'm usually in my meditation room by 6 a.m., uh, and my routine is that I will, uh, I will review my, my morning prayer, my goals, I, I will sit and meditate, I will visualize, uh, I will um, read, and then I will likely journal. And I'll journal for anywhere between 5 and 20 minutes, depending on any insights or inspiration that came through for me to self-reflect. And, uh, and that's it. I'll then go hit the gym for half an hour. And... Yeah, and that's my morning routine. By 9 a.m., I've invested in my mind and my body, my spirit, and I'm ready for the day. That's, that's all there is to it. What kind of meditation do you do? Um, 6 a.m. is kind of early. A lot of people fall asleep when they try to do morning meditation. So is this the jumping jack meditation? Like, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> uh, I actually have a rebounder in my meditation room, would you believe? But I, I oh, tend yeah. to get on the rebounder, uh, for, and I have my goals on the wall and my, my incantations, and I'll rebound what, to start with. That kind of gets the blood flowing a little bit, especially if you, you do have a little bit of morning mode creeping in. And uh, so for me, by the time I'm meditating and sitting down, I'm already vibrating, I'm already buzzing, I'm already in, in a, a state of positive energy at that level. But for, for meditation, uh, it, it will vary. Predominantly, it's about breathing and focus and being present. I don't have a fancy technique. I mean, I've spent time with some of the Zen masters, you know, living on mountaintops and, yeah. and spending time with people that do that for 20 years, but that's, that's not, my, you know, that's not my, my deal. Where as long as I can quiet my mind, and if my mind doesn't want to be quiet, then as long as I can observe my mind from a, a deeper place of, of witnessing it rather than getting caught up in the, 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 the merry-go-round of thoughts that most people try and, and control, you're not going to control your mind. Yeah, get, get, as long as you can disidentify with the fact that you are not your thoughts, <laughs> it allows you a deeper place to witness them from. And I think that's the challenge with most people that try and meditate. They try and control their thoughts. Yet your mind is an unruly child. Yeah, for, for most people, yeah, the, the constant stimulation through the day, you know, especially in today's multi-connected social media world, it, your mind is constantly being trained to be unruly. So for you to then think that in 20 minutes a morning you're going to master that is, you know, it's like trying to go to the jungle and tame a lion. You're not going to do it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's not going to happen. So if you can disidentify and come to the place, the fact that I am not my thoughts. Yeah, my thoughts are a very small part of who I am. You know, I'm, if, if my, my conscious is, is a, a fishbowl full of water, the, the, you know, the thoughts are the fish. Yeah, but if I can come at it from understanding that I'm, I'm more than that, I'm the water. 
The fish happen to swim through that from time to time, but that isn't me. I, I'm, I'm deeper than that. It's easier to, I think, <clears throat> calm yourself and, and not get caught up by being hooked on you know, all, all the usual stuff that hooks the mind. Now, I share your view there exactly. You, know, you are not your thoughts. Yet there's a huge number, or there are a huge number of listeners who are going to say, but wait, I, I'm a rational being. You know, it's all about the rationality of my thoughts. How do you draw the line between sort of the soft world of meditation where you are not your thoughts and the hard world, which is, well, if I think about it, A leads to B, B leads to C, therefore A leads to C. That, that kind of, of rationalist view of the world versus something where eh, the thoughts happened, I acknowledge the thoughts, I use the thoughts, but I am not the thoughts. A lot of my clients, a lot of the people who read my blog struggle with that. Like they don't want to be too airy fairy and they don't want to be, you know, hard ass robots. Like how do you walk that line down the middle? You have to chunk up a little bit to a high level of awareness and, and open up to the fact that if you can't come to a place where you recognize that there is a, a physical and a metaphysical, you're always going to be stumped. So yes, we, we know that there is metaphysical and metaphysical simply means outside of the realm of the five physical senses. That's so, you know, when was the last time you rationalized being in love? Now that's, that, that's, not a, that, that's not something that operates through causality in Newtonian physics. Yeah, that's if you walk up to your you know, wife-to-be and, and go through a checklist, yeah, I don't put a lot of, uh, <laughs> I don't put a lot, a lot of hope on, on lasting marriage of uncondi uh, unconditional love. So, you know, there, there's the part of us that makes us humans. There is a spiritual aspect to us, you know, or a metaphysical aspect or an intangible aspect. Because if, if you were to say to somebody, you know, who are you? If you want to live in the physical world, you are not your body. Right? Yeah, you, I know that because you've got a very different body now than you had when you were five years old. Yep. You know, you're going to have a different body now than when you're 80 years old. That's non-negotiable. But it's still the same essence of you. So the real essence of you has to be non-physical. Right? It's, it's the, it's the non-physical. Yep. It's, it's your sense of humor. It's your personality, your charisma, your beliefs, your values, your dreams, your hopes, your wishes. If I was to take that out of you and put it into somebody else, then it would be you in a different body. So if you can understand that, no, okay, I'm not my thoughts, but you know, how does that translate day to day when I've got a mortgage to pay? Well, understand the possibility to be open to that fact first because it'll allow you a different perspective. You have control, limited control a lot of the time, over your thoughts, but if you start identifying with them, you fall into a trap. Yeah, as much as if you identify yourself with your body, you fall into a trap. You know, you're, you're not your body. As Jesus didn't know himself as his body. Muhammad didn't know himself as his body. Yeah, you, you have to have a level of appreciation by chunking up to a higher level of awareness. Now, if that's not your journey right now, then fair enough. You know, biological maturity is not something we get to vote on. Emotional maturity <laughs> and spiritual maturity is a choice. And for some people that get too caught up in the day-to-day, Maybe that right now that's not their time. The challenge is that, the, or the paradox is, the more you tend to um, sit with a level of personal inquiry at that level, the more things start to, to you know, uh, allow the mind to relax because it'll start to see things that operate outside of causality. And when it has amassed enough evidence to do that, it tends to release its death grip on, on circumstance amazingly uh, just literate and well well worded well phrased description of that and uh, thank you for sharing that um, I actually haven't found a very good way to, to try and explain that concept I've make a part of my own practice to not say you know I have a cold it's more like my body has this because I'm trying to just build into my view of the world that actually you know I'm not my body and I'm not my thoughts because I think about all kinds of weird stuff <laughs> or at least my mind does, and it's like, yeah, whatever. But that isn't uh, me. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have to feel guilty about that. That yeah, was just a thought. Like, yeah, maybe I would like to do that, but I'm not going to. So I'm just going to set that side, <laughs> that thought aside right now, uh, and that can be really liberating. But when you switch gears and you you look at say what an entrepreneur does, and you look at what they do in business, how does that emotional response in the body, even that metaphysical side of things, as well as the physical side of things, come into play? Like your emotions can be the boss, your rational thinking can be the boss, but when you're, you know, the business boss, not just the boss of your, your own biology, uh, what, how, how do you lean one way or the other just as an entrepreneur, not just as a, a fully functioning human being? 
Uh, for me, it has, again, to do with recognizing that the, the, the physical world tends to have its, its, its basis or, uh, in, in the mind. Yeah, your, your, your thoughts react to, to the outside world, your, your logic, your reasoning, your, uh, your associations, you know, your conclusions, deductions, all, all stem from, from the mind, all of which is busy doing whatever it does when a, a business decision has to be made, when a, a functional decision has to be made. But we have a thinking center, granted, and it's exceptionally useful if we tend to you know, take charge of it more of the time rather than have it run us. But we also have a feeling center, and the feeling center is where a lot of people tend to have this misnomer. It's not the airy-fairy, emotional world of reacting to circumstances. You know, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm horny, I'm, I'm whatever it is. There's a lot of emotions and biochemicals that, that you know, interact in the physical body uh, that you know, drive the thoughts based on reaction to emotion. But there's also a deeper sense of self that comes from, you know, call it a you know, uh, heart level of intelligence. You know, we, we now understand in science that the heart has its own brain, 40,000 neurons as a minimum, and the impetus of the intelligence of the decisions that the heart brain makes is the basis for what the, the head brain should actually listen to first. Most of the time we have it wide the opposite way around. We'll make a logical decision yeah, and, and, and then you know, try and uh, rationalize it the way we do, or we try and justify our emotional reaction with logic. We don't go deeper than that and say, you know, ultimately get, get rid of the emotional reaction caused by you know, either frustration or you know, joy or, or reaction to whatever biochemical endorphins or serotonin or cortisone reactions going on in my body. Um, what's beneath that? What, you know, people ask me about leadership. I'll give a very quick example. Yeah. There's a billion books on leadership. There's a, a, a thousand different courses. There's many different models and, and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Leadership com comes down to one predominant principle. Yeah. Do what's right. <laughs> yes. You know? And if you're willing to be unpopular in the moment for what you believe to be right, you've got the genesis of true leadership right there. Now we can go through all sorts of fancy different terms and, and stages and labels and, and translations, but ultimately you'll get more out of becoming a personal leader by doing what's right, independent of the good opinion of others and the need for approval and significance. Yeah? Not what you feel you need to impose on somebody else to prove your point, that's a different game. Yeah, that's, that's emotional immaturity, trying to masquerade through a, a level of ego and significance and being a bully. Yeah, but do what's right, we know what's right underneath yeah, strip everything away, listen to your freaking heart, right? Understand that when push comes to shove, yeah, and you, you reflect after the fact, you knew what you needed to do. We either didn't have the we, you know, we either didn't have the courage to make that decision because there was other patterns running, right? Or we justified it because the mind was in charge. So coming back to your original question, you know, the thinking sense is useful, but if it leads the show, you you're on a hamster wheel to frustration most of the time. Yeah, if your reaction to is geared based on emotions, then yeah, you you never have a sense of groundedness. But if you can go deeper than that and come from a a, a deeper part of your feeling center, where you know, call it your soul, you know, without getting too esoteric, call it you know, your, the part, the essence of you, yeah, or as, as someone like you know, Hawkins would call it, the eye of the eye, yeah, the yes. center of you, yeah, then you have a very different level of presence. Yeah, and you realize there's no you know, better tomorrows, there's no worse yesterdays, there's only a present moment where you can make an intelligent, informed, and congruent decision that aligns your heart, your emotions, and your mind. From there, you're free to do what you want. So I, I did not know that you were a fan of, of Hawkins. That's awesome. And very esoteric. One of the things that I, I struggle with when I work with clients is that a lot of the concepts that you're talking about are, are ineffable and that there aren't really great words to describe whatever that thing is. One of the techniques that I use is uh, I'm a certified heart math trainer using heart rate variability training. Uh, is that something that, that you use as well in your own practice uh, to help connect with that part of you? I found for me it was right, one of the there. first ways I could. Uh, if you go into my meditation room right now, uh, alongside the, the incense, you'll find a heart math sensor. <laughs> there you go. So these techniques uh, are, are so powerful. And it's surprising how many people uh, will say, yeah, I, I do that. People who are at your level of performance. 
And it's in my mind, it's almost like cheating because I can meditate. I've been to Tibet and Nepal and Peru and all that. Uh, but I find when I have a sensor, sometimes I just get more meditation per minute. And that's also a variable. You know, it, it would be very luxurious to spend eight hours a day meditating to be you know, perfectly aligned with that little ineffable thing that we're both talking about there. So that's one of the things I use, but what are the faster ways to happiness that you might use aside from heart math? Like, are, are there things that make you happier that you found make people who work for you or with you happier more quickly? Because a lot of people uh, just aren't happy. What are they? Uh, the, the, two, two, two aspects. One, right, for first, one of the things I'll do to start with is give people the fastest way to unhappiness because usually <laughs> it's normally what stops people from being happy, okay. right, uh, rather than allowing them to be happy, if you know what I mean. So yeah. one of the fastest ways to unhappiness that I see predominantly um, uh, as the, the major obstacle in most people's level of, of fulfillment is trying to get somebody else to be, do, have, or behave in a way that you want them to be, do, yeah, uh, act, or behave. And uh, we, we tend to forget that you know, we perceive our world through our five senses, and they can be different for every single other person. You know, we all have five senses that process incoming information into the body, and it is only through those five senses that we can perceive the physical world. Yeah, anybody listening or watching this right now, whether you know, they're using sight or sound or you know, feeling the air conditioning or the seat that they're sitting on or, or the bus they're riding on or whatever it is, yeah, everything in their outer world that's coming to them through this podcast is being filtered first through one of those five senses. So the obvious question to ask to, to flag up to, or to remind people that you know, we create our own reality moment by moment is how many of us all like the same food? Oh, yeah, we, we, we've got a variable instantly. How many of us all like the same music? How many of us all have the same favorite color? Yeah, how many of us all like the same smell? Yeah, that, that's why so many different levels of, of perfumes and aftershaves. Yeah, we've all got a different sense of what we like to smell. So from, from that sense, you come to a conclusion, an unavoidable and inescapable conclusion that two people could be standing side by side, inhabiting pretty much the same space in the same moment in time experience the same event or experience in the outer world, use the same equipment to process that event called the five senses and come up with an entirely different conclusion as to what that, you know, that means or, or you know, what, what that experience uh, 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 effect is for them. Now, the, the clear question is, who's right? <laughs> yeah, and, and most of our time we spend justifying why our interpretation is right and unfortunately, most people have to get buy-in from others to validate why their sense is right by getting external agreement. And the more people agree with me, the more I feel good about being right because I'm justified because obviously I experienced it. Well, wake up. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, no, you experience what's right for you and somebody else is going to experience what's right for them. And that's besides the other filters that are going on. Your experience, your beliefs, your cultural upbringings, your sense of values, your sense of your emotional uh, yeah, mood at the time. All of those different cofactors. So if you can if you can give up the game of trying to have other people you know, act in a way that fits your pictures, you'll start you know, avoiding the fastest route to unhappiness. Now you can also throw in at that at a higher level reality. Now I I, I gave up fighting reality quite a while ago for one simple reason. It kept winning, and yeah, and so to to allow um, yeah yourself the, the, the permission to let go of a lot of the stuff that's out there that disagrees with you know, your, what you think reality should look like is another way to get off that. Now, if you want the key to happiness, uh, I'm, th th there's kind of a complicated way and an uncomplicated way. The complicated way is what most people vote on, right? And that's, that's how they set up the game. And the, the complicated way to happiness is, you know, when I get... Yeah, fill in the blank. Yeah. Yeah, the right relationship, more money, a better car, the house of my dreams, the girl of my dreams, whatever it is, fill in the blank. When I get, you know, when the outer world fits the pictures of what I think my inner world is saying it should look like in order to be happy, then I will give myself permission to be happy. That's very complicated and unfortunately is a hamster wheel to nowhere for most people. Now, because the energy field of desire will never be complete you'll get temp temporary level of satisfaction, but desire is like a drug. Yeah, it's not a state of, um, that you, you conquer. 
Desire is an ongoing process. Therefore, whatever you desire, you think you're going to get to be happy. Once you get it, you may get a temporary sense of achievement, but the desire as an energy field is self-perpetuating. So it has to replace itself with something else. But that's a trap most people don't recognize. So that's the complicated way. And you know, I spent many, many years doing that and you know, somewhat fruitlessly uh, chasing my tail, as I think a lot of people appreciate. The simple way to happiness is a little easier. Think happy thoughts. <laughs> and you suddenly come to the you know, mind-blowing awareness that all happiness ever can be is a real-time present condition of thinking happy thoughts. Now, if you set up the game to say that you'll only allow yourself to do that once the outer world fits certain pictures that aren't currently fulfilled, then good luck, keep chasing. But all you're ever gonna do is give yourself permission to do what you can give yourself permission to do right now. And if you wanna be happy, or if you look back in your, your past and uh, the times you were happy, I guarantee you that's all that's going on. You were thinking happy thoughts. So on the, on the flip side, it, it is easier to be happy when your basic needs are met, right? And most people's basic needs are a moving target. Most people don't understand what their basic <laughs> needs are. Yeah, I, I go to Google Edo in Cape Town, and basic needs are, can I have an extra spoon of rice? Yeah, I go, I walk down the street and, and listen to some of the conversations in the Dubai Mall, and you'd think most six-year-olds' basic needs are, can I have an extra iPad? You're, you're exactly right. The, one of the happiest groups of people I ever saw that was really touching was in Cambodia, uh, not more than a decade or two after the country was just t horribly traumatized. Very poor people, a dollar a day is the average income, not enough food, walking around happier than the average person you'd see in a mall anywhere in America. Just yeah. completely amazing because they were thinking happy thoughts and you know walking around singing songs and there was suffering, but there was still happiness at the same time, which is was an eye opener to me at the time. And, it, and it, it's similar to what you're saying. The, the word need there maybe is part of the problem because it's not actually what you needed. It's what you thought you needed. Well, as, as human beings, uh, you, you've got to understand that we, we don't get to vote on whether we are going to be programmed or not. We are programmable people. You know, we yeah. don't do things out of um, uh, uh, rational thinking most of the time, unfortunately. We, <laughs> we do quite a bit out of passion, but most of what we do, we do out of consistently ingrained habit, and those habits are based upon programming, majority of which is unconscious. Now, people in Cambodia at that particular time didn't really have... Yeah, access to 30,000 commercial messages a day programming them as to why they're unhappy without a certain product. Yeah, they weren't plugged into things like, you know, um, constant negative news or CNN, as most people call it. And they, yeah, they, they weren't exposed to a level of outside programming that they feel they still have free will to make decisions on, which is the furthest thing from the truth, right? Because whether or not you're going to be programmed, you say, isn't, isn't a choice. How you want to be programmed is a choice, but most people on default uh, leave that completely open and therefore susceptible to the agendas of others. It's like sailing on an ocean. You don't get to control the wind. You're going to be blown. You're going to be blown. How you utilize that based upon where you, you know, angled your sail, you do get to choose. But if you sort of sit on deck and think, well, you know, I'm, I'm sailing, I'm just going to bimble around, you're going to wake up next morning somewhere off course or at the mercy of whatever the wind is. Now, the challenge in today's society is that the wind has an agenda. Yeah, the media has agendas. Mm -hmm. Commercial you know, bias has agendas. And they spend a lot of money and hire a lot of smart people to figure out how you can be unconsciously programmed yeah, the most effective, efficient, and, and clinical way possible that if you are walking around without a specific focus or intention to take charge of your own programming, I guarantee you, you're going to be picked up and put on the fast track of how somebody else wants that to happen. That's just the way it is. I've used a lot of technology as well as meditation to become aware of the automated responses my body has and to learn how to, to reprogram them so that they serve me much better than serving some other uses. What are the techniques that you use that make the most difference for becoming aware of your internal messages, including the ones that you got programmed from media or just from the way you were raised, becoming aware of them and then changing them so that you don't have to go through that rational loop of recognizing, thinking, and then doing, whereas you can just change the actual response in the first place. Do you have a way to do that? Ask better questions. 
Yeah, be, be present enough to ask intelligent and smart questions. Yeah, what's really going on here yeah. is a great question. <laughs> yeah, what, what, is the, you know, what is the agenda that's, that's happening right now? Yeah, what does this really mean? Because most people, again, are walking around uh, offering themselves to be emotionally manipulated and have no clue. Yeah. Uh, and trust me, as I said, there's a lot of smart people out there right now that get hired by a lot of corporations that yeah, are paid very handsomely to figure out how to press your buttons. Yeah. And so if you allow your buttons to be pressed without saying, well, hang on a minute. Now, when you come to the awareness that nobody can do anything to you emotionally without your permission, you start to understand levels of freedom of thought and freedom of response. Uh, and the challenge is most people don't like responsibility to be able to do that because they hold responsibility as a way to, you know, to, to feel that it's, it's kind of extra burden. I have more, enough responsibility at work. I have enough responsibility with my family. But, but stop and have a look at the, the word for a second, responsibility, the ability to respond. So if you want to take responsibility for your own emotional reactions, if you want to take responsibility for your own you know, uh, quality of life, your own quality of experience, it's got nothing to do with whether you're driving the car you want. It's got everything to do with a moment by moment appreciation of the fact that nobody can do anything to you emotionally without your permission. And when you start taking charge of the, your your uh, response and your reaction rather than just you know run off a pattern it, it, it's kind of like pe people have a whole series of movies pre-recorded and it's like being a human jukebox or a human sort of movie jukebox and as soon as somebody says or does or anything that presses a certain sequence of buttons yeah you go into a part of the brain that has a preset response on a preset recorded DVD it goes in the slot presses play and you act out something that is unconscious that you didn't even get to vote on. Right? So somebody turns around and says, hey, you're an asshole. And you're like, how dare you call me a, you know, whatever it is. Yeah? So they just press the button. Yeah. And you went to the yeah, pre-recorded, like, say, if somebody does this, I press this movie, yeah, I play this movie, and this is what happens. Wake up. Yeah, you're better than that. Right? If somebody calls you that, right, and how about compassion? <laughs> How about saying, you know something, there's somebody, obviously, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you up in traffic, classic one. Now you want to make it real, especially on the roads in Dubai. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you drive around, somebody cuts you up, apart from the fact it's predictable, right? You're like, son of a, you know, it's like, and, and you start reacting off a pattern. You want to get ahead of them, or you want to give them a, a, a piece of your mind, or you want to, you, you chase them down the road. Now, can you just imagine? That and you've got your son or daughter in the car. What, what is it? You know, what's daddy or, or mummy teaching them yeah. about mastery of emotional response? No, nothing. Yeah, ha, could, and, and that could probably lead to some pretty bad scenarios at the next set of traffic lights if that get out of control. As opposed to you suddenly see this guy, you know, you know who's all mean looking and, and overtakes you and cuts you up, and you're like, I tell you what, he obviously needs the road more than I do. I'm so grateful I'm not having a day like he's had. Yeah, and for all yeah. you know, he's got someone dying in the back seat. You, you just don't know, right? Send him some love. Yeah. All right. If he needs the, if he knows the road so much that he's going to do that, then yeah, I'm grateful that that's not me sitting in the car. That was one of the more difficult things I ever learned. The way I finally did that, Peter, was with the the heart math sensor. <laughs> I learned to drive in traffic <laughs> and keep the light green. And every time someone cuts you off, it'll turn red. It took me two weeks of doing that every day before I could finally keep it green when someone cut me off. Uh, because, I mean, it just makes you want to kill. It, it really does. And that's that's your body, your fight or flight. You know, it somehow thinks the guy's a tiger or whatever else. But to reverse that programming in myself took a long time uh, because I, I used to be kind of a jerk on the road. And uh, I'm glad to say I'm not anymore. So, <laughs> well, well, well done on being an example there. But one thing I'd invite, invite listeners or, or, or viewers to, to look at is our self language, our, our self you know, you know, vocalization. Yeah, you know? because if we turn around and say, you know, that you know, son of a bitch made me mad, guess what? Complete untruth, absolute lie, right? At least, even if you can't unhook emotionally, allow yourself the gift of being truthful, even if nobody else hears it. See, you know what I'm saying? I chose to make myself mad based upon what they did. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean to say you're going to agree with them, but here's another level of, of, um, 
uh, mastery that would allow people to raise their level of consciousness. When I look at behavior in others that I would, let's say, disagree with, or falls outside of my values, or you know, at, uh, at best would elicit a negative response, uh, and at worst would drive me mad, yeah, whatever it is. One of the things that would teach people very quickly how to, to, to move through that level of, you know, uh, or raise their level of consciousness to a point where they can become self-masters, uh, and that's really what we're talking about. It's about you know, becoming masters of our own emotional response rather than allow us to be hooked and pulled and pushed and, and you know, like, like everybody else has got the puppet strings. Because you know, that's not a life that leads to any level of fulfillment. And so if you see somebody acting out of accordance with how you feel they should be acting, right, then one of the first things that I, I, I do is I put myself in their shoes and I have to come to the place of understanding that, look, people do things for reasons, right? Case closed, that's you know, psychological fact. People do things for reasons. Now, they may not be your reasons, and they may not be my reasons, but I know that they do things for reasons. So unless I can put myself in somebody else's shoes to the extent that I can, understanding that if I was them with their history, their story, their current emotional frame of mind, their belief system, their screwed up, call it model of the world, whatever label or judgment you want to do, whatever it is, if I cannot put myself in their shoes and fully associate to the fact that if I was them, I would also have done what they did, then I have no right to judge. Now, it doesn't mean to say that once I step out of that shoes, that I don't have to agree with them, of course. But unless I can't, I can put myself in their shoes and come to the place of awareness that understand authentically and sincerely that, yeah, I would do that and I can be that person because we've all been idiots, assholes, impatient, you know, short-tempered, yeah, badass son of a bitch, unloving, unlovable. There isn't a word in the English language that can describe human behavior that we've not encountered, embodied, and been at some point in our life. Case closed. Right? So if we can't come to the awareness that, you know, if I can't step inside that person's shoes and and appreciate why they've done it. Doesn't mean say I need to agree with it once I step out of their shoes. If I can't appreciate the fact or come to the awareness that if I was them in that state with their mindset, their history, their story, yeah, that I wouldn't have done the same thing, then I have absolutely no right to impose my judgment or, or model of the world onto that person. But most of us do, we're too quick to do it. Oh, look at that idiot doing what he's doing. Well, guess what, you were that idiot at one point or you certainly could be. Yeah. So unhook, come from a, a place of non-judgment to the extent that not, doesn't mean say you're trying to put the world to rights. No, you've got no right to put the world to rights. <laughs> Wake up. The only right that we have in this world from my perspective is to try and be the best us we can be. Yeah. And, and if you yeah, or, or I have this be in our bonnet about, you know, we've got to fix the education system, we've got to fix the economy, the government sucks, you know, blah, 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 all of this, and we're on a mission to try and fix everybody else's world, then I've seen that lead to a lot of frustration. Yeah. Now, you, you take Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela didn't build schools. Nelson Mandela didn't go and fix other people's problems. He didn't try and address what was wrong. He became the example for others to follow by being the best him he could be, irrespective of his, his past, right or wrong, yeah, he had a level of you know, 27 years of, of time to mature emotionally to lead a country through one of the most traumatic and, and difficult times that could have so descended into violence like that. And he didn't. But he didn't do it by running around trying to fix everybody else's issues and telling them why they were wrong. No, he became the example. And as a result of that, he changed millions more lives than anybody building schools in Africa. Yeah, the, the idea that if you want to change the world, uh, change yourself it's it's true and it's so hard to imagine and to choose to react with compassion when people are are doing things that make the world a worse place is is a, a definitely difficult choice but it's one that you see people make and when they do they create really big change what it's, is it's not about go ahead it's not about levels of understanding because yeah. intellect plays very little part of that it's all about levels of awareness and you know for example if you know, when, when I was 16, uh, as I'm sure many other people listening here that you know, can probably remember that far back, 
Yeah, I thought I got the world pretty sussed out. Yeah, 16, oh, yeah. We, we, we got our stuff together, right? Yeah, we know how everything is. Now, when we're 25 and we look back at the 16-year-old us, how much of the world do we actually really have sussed out at 16? Right? <laughs> Nothing. Right? But can, you, can a 25-year-old explain to a 16-year-old what the world is like at 25? Well, they can explain it and they can intellectually probably understand some of it, but there's no way they can experience it because the base isn't big enough. Yeah? The question of wanting to have self-inquiry to the point of, of you know, maturing emotionally or spiritually is about recognizing that wherever we are right now, our base isn't big enough to understand what's next. And being okay with that. You know, when you're 40, you look at back at 25 when you thought you really had the world sussed and realize how little we had the world sussed. But at 25, you can't experience life as a 40 year old, not because you're not intelligent, not because, you, not because of your IQ or you, you're going to learn some new technique on meditating at 40. No, your base isn't big enough. Yeah, so to turn around to somebody at 16 and say, look, you should react with compassion rather than you know, making an obscene gesture through the window, uh, it's, you, know, you, you, you can't judge somebody for that because we're on a path and that path unfolds. Now, the path unfolds probably faster when you have the intention to move forward. But nobody was born enlightened. Yeah, you know, Buddha wasn't born enlightened. Right? It was a journey of progression. And that is the journey for most people. So, you know, at 41 years old now myself, I'm, you know, I know that, yes, I look back at when I was 30 or 25 and the ego-driven idiot that I was at the time, uh, and I see how much of the world that I didn't know. You know, I wouldn't have reacted with compassion. You called me an asshole, I'd have probably headbutted you. Yep. <laughs> right? Yeah, but now I, you know, it doesn't mean to say that the person I was then is any less significant or, or, or worse than I am. It's just levels of awareness. But I can't, I can't go back and tell myself that because I wouldn't understand it at that age. Yeah. So, you know, for, for people that have had the, 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 the humility uh, and the, the, the grace to have allowed themselves to progress, you know, one of the temptations sometimes is to judge others that haven't had that level of awareness yet. Yeah, you can't do that. You can only be the example for them to follow and unhook from the whether they should or shouldn't. What? Not a lot of people know this, but uh, Bulletproof is a pretty small company right now, but three of my key employees are more than 20 years older than I am. Because <laughs> I figure they must have a bigger base than I do, and they certainly have more experience than I do, and I rely heavily on their advice because I figure whoever I'm going to be when I'm 50, by the way, I'm 41 also, um, about to turn 42 at some point coming up here. Um, but it, it's really interesting just to see the world through their eyes and through mine and, and I know that I don't have that kind of experience. And I think that's one of the things that's helped uh, help me to do what I'm doing just because I, I recognizing that there must be a lot more I don't know because my base now is a lot better than, like you said, at 25 or 16, because uh, I was definitely a jerk back then. Uh, and, <laughs> and I work on being much less of one these days. There's something that comes into play here, though, and that's wealth. You've been a very successful serial entrepreneur. I, I had the fortunate and unfortunate lesson of making six million dollars and then losing it in my mid-20s which, which <laughs> that's not so fun your company went bankrupt etc cetera, etc cetera. most people only hear the dave made six million dollars he's a rich a-hole and i'm like it didn't quite go down like that i've been working for the past 20 years for a reason and what what is the role of, of wealth and people's emotional and spiritual like inner awareness and their connection to wealth what's your take on that uh, great question, and, and one that is probably one of the biggest areas that prevents people from climbing through levels of awareness is they get stuck at money. Yeah. And you know, I, don't, I don't know how, how much longer we have, but you know, from from my side, for money, you know, uh, how can I put it? Once you understand what what money is at a higher level of awareness, you can stop chasing the damn thing because money is simply and always will be a reflection of what value you add case closed it's an arbitrary medium of exchange money means nothing uh, if if the economy uh, went you know foobar tomorrow and we we're left with a million dollars and it was cold you'd burn it right to stay warm yeah m money has no intrinsic value in the way that we represent it right now all it is is a byproduct or a consequence of how much value you add now the reason most people don't like that awareness is because if you don't have enough 
That means you have to look in front of the mirror and say, well, that means I haven't given enough. And most people's sense of what they think they're giving is enough, but they just don't feel as if they have enough money. So uh, the, the other aspect of this is that yeah, most people, unfortunately, don't recognize that there are two bank accounts. Yeah, there is a financial bank account, which everybody focuses on, but there's an emotional bank account. And most people's emotional bank account, unfortunately, follows their financial bank account. So if your financial bank account is lower than what you would like it to be, then usually your emotional bank account isn't too far behind. And yeah, people who think that money will solve all of their problems uh, you know, are living in Disneyland. The challenge with that pre prevalent belief system for most people is that money solves problems is because those that don't have access to a lot of money, most of their immediate problems center or are caused by lack of money. So therefore the illusion is that the more money I have, then the less problems I'll get. Well, that's just not true. Yeah, you'll, you'll have bigger problems and better quality problems, but yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's a different conversation. But yeah, you ask somebody who's you know, worth 10, 20 million dollars if, if problems go away and they'll laugh at you. So, yeah, but if you have the situation where your psychology is wired, that your financial bank account follows your, um, uh, your emotional bank account rather follows your financial bank account, you will always be poor financially. And that is because we, what we weren't taught in school is that the financial bank account is a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. <laughs> In other words, if we want our financial bank account to go up, our emotional bank account has to go up first. Otherwise, we're tied into a negative feedback loop. Yeah. Now, there is a time delay because we live in operate in, in a paradigm, what's known as Newtonian physics and causality, which means that, yeah, that the circumstantial reality that we need to create to increase money doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens instantaneously in the metaphysical world. You start vibrating at a level of, of positive attraction. You start appreciating things. You start getting onto a, a, a level of raising your emotional bank account to a high level. The financial bank account has to follow, but it doesn't follow at three o'clock on Tuesday when we want it to. Yeah, because in the in the in the metaphysical world, things happen instantaneously. So that what we call it, or what Hawkins would call an attractor pattern, is already set. Yeah, you, you you've sent the message out. But people don't give it long enough because they want to see immediate results or they're hooked into yeah, their, their emotional bank account and gets tied back to their financial bank account. So then all of a sudden, you know, you're back on the negative loop. Now, to give an example, now, if you are um, in a dream, if you want something to happen, it happens instantly. You want to fly, you fly. Now, so in the, in the metaphysical world, things happen straight away. Yeah, it's almost like a little boat, uh, a remote control boat on a pond. You, you, you turn left on the control and boom, boom, instantly turns left. But in the physical world, the time it takes for that attractive pattern to translate into circumstantial reality and for the universe to rearrange itself to allow that financial bank account to follow the emotional bank account is like an oil tanker on the ocean. You turn the wheel left and nothing happens for two kilometers. Yeah, but you have to give it time. The signal has been sent. Right? You, you know, you, the boat has to turn. Yep. But if halfway after a kilometer you spin the wheel back and say this, this shit doesn't work, <laughs> then I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> no, nobody voted on the fact that you, you, know, you, know, you get to control when that happens. But the speed that the boat turns at is totally linked to the congruency and the alignment between your thinking center and your feeling center and the consistency of, the, consistency of that frequency that you're broadcasting. So, you know, talk about money. Money is a reflection of the value you add, and that value you add isn't just about giving 40 hours a week right, to an employer or a product or a service into the marketplace. What value are you adding to, to, the, you know, to, to the world that you're, you're inhabiting? Yeah, we're all guests on this planet. But if you're kicking and complaining, and here's why most people's financial bank account stays low, because what they do is, I'll, I'll give another metaphor. Imagine walking into an art gallery or a museum. You go into a museum, you've been invited in. As I said, we're all guests on this planet. And you walk into the room and the exhibit is called Your Life. And you walk into this room and you look around and you don't actually like the exhibits. In fact, they're disgusting. They don't please you. Now you've got a couple of different things you do. Here's what most people do. Having bought the ticket and walked into that, that exhibit. 
They stop stamping their feet, shouting and demanding the curator comes and changes all the exhibits around for something they like. Now, if you did that in the museum, what would actually happen? <laughs> You'd leave. Security would come and you would be thrown <laughs> out of the town museum. Yes. Right? Now, would you have any um, chance of demanding, having bought your ticket, that the curator comes and changes it? Is anything in that room going to change? Not at all. Not at all. So you have absolutely no right to complain at the exhibits in the room called your life. However, you have every right to choose to walk into a different room. So if you're bitching and complaining about the exhibits in your life right now, guess what? That is the glue that keeps you tied to them. Quit that because you're, it'll keep your emotional bank account at zero and your financial bank account will have no chance to change. But you have every right. So you listen. If I recognize that my financial bank account is simply a reflection of what my emotional bank account has been doing for the last couple of months, then it's no wonder most of it's in the shape that it's in. Hey, that's positive confirmation that the system works. So I'm going to make a commitment to go out and walk into a different room and maintain and hold that course. And nobody can come back to me in two months that authentically does that and tells me that that hasn't shifted. It may not shift exactly how they want, but the only people that complain are the ones that go in for three days see that it hasn't changed and then complain about it and spin the wheel back on the tank. Peter, the part about your emotional bank account leading your financial bank account, is that based on, is that something you invented or is that based on some particular teaching or work that you've come across? Because it, it's brilliant and I've never heard it before. What's the source the, of that? The, the, the analogy of the, the, the personal finance bank account is something that I overlay because I, I think people can understand that. It, it's really um, well said and it's it makes great sense. So that's brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, I, I could go into many different levels of tangible, intangible, physical, metaphysical, Newtonian causality, you know, nonlinear dynamics. But most people get the analogy of you know, financial bank account, emotional bank account. It just makes it easy for those that, you know, that aren't in the nerdery like sometimes we are learning, you know, advanced theoretical physics and, and, and metaphysics. <laughs> so, you know, that, and to be fair, when you get to all through translating, that's pretty much what's going on. It, it's the simplest way I've ever heard it explained, and it jives with my reality 100%. I want to be very respectful of your time, but we have oh, one I'm, more. I'm here as long as you want me. Oh, you've got some time. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and, one... and actually, actually David, before yeah. we jump off the su subject of money, mm -hmm. I'd just like to, to throw in one other level of awareness that I think is, is very valuable for, for a lot of people. Uh, and that is, you know, having, obviously having worked with, with Tony for the last probably, I don't know, 14 or, or, or so years now, Tony Robbins. You know, I, I was actually Tony's youngest ever trainer in 2002, which I was very uh, proud of at the time. Looking back, I now realize how little I knew as a trainer back then. <laughs> but that's, uh, again, we're, we're all on our own journey. But, but one thing uh, I, I certainly credit and, and attribute Tony for raising my level of awareness is, is what he calls the primary fear. Uh, and the primary fear is the fear that we're not enough. Yeah, I mean, we're born with two natural fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Everything else is learned. But the fear that we're not enough is usually the root cause of most of the issues that I spend a lot of time working in psychotherapeutic intervention yeah, around the world. Uh, that, that's usually where it has its genesis. So you know, the fear that we're not enough, not good enough predominantly for a lot of people, not rich enough, not certain enough, not loved enough, not happy enough, not tall enough, short enough, fill in the blank. We've all got a blank to fill in at that level predominantly unless you, you start transcending into much higher levels of awareness. So, yeah, for, for the, the fear that we're not enough, let's just overlay money on this. One of the major challenges, um, and I, I started seeing this when, when I looked into the, 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 the issue around money that people have uh, and the, the psychology that prevents them from raising their financial or their emotional bank account. And that is that most people make the, the, the fundamental, critical, and, and yeah, yeah, devastating mistake. Yeah, I can't understate this. Yeah, devastating mistake that they combine and intertwine their self-worth with their net worth. And that, again, is down to a lot of the conditionality and the programming that 21st century reality has put on most people. You're good enough if... You drive the right car, have the right business card, the right job description, you know, blah, 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 fill in the blank, right? So if you have your self-worth and your net worth tied, most of the time, if your net worth is threatened, it triggers the fear that you are not enough because your self-worth is automatically linked. 
That's one of the reasons why I see most people compromise their values around money faster than anything else. It's not because they're bad people. It's just that their association to their self-worth and net worth is so strong that if they're, you know, they will make decisions that will compromise their values around money so that the trigger, the, the, the fear that they're not enough is not set off because most people will do almost anything to avoid that. Yeah? And, uh, and so if people can want to take a step forward in, in creating financial abundance, unhook your self-worth from your net worth. Understand that you were born good enough and you don't need a bank account to prove that. Now, understand that regardless of what happens, you're not going to take it with you. Yeah, you don't, don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. Right? The only people that tried to take wealth with them were the Egyptians, and the only thing that happened is we dug it up and stole it. <laughs> yeah, right? that, that, that doesn't work. Yep. Yeah, true, that, that's why there's a big difference between wealth and fulfillment. Yeah, most people are so poor, all they have is money. Yeah, and, uh, and if you're chasing that, and most people do to validate their self-worth, then again, you, you're on a hamster wheel to, to unfulfillment that unfortunately, yeah, that, that's a tunnel with no cheese. Yeah, it's, yeah, and most people wake up at the end and you, you know, it begs the question, well, what is the grand prize? Yeah, is it a fleet of Bentleys? Because here's what I know, Dave. I've never, I've never been around people, and I have yeah, been around people who are at the end of their life. People that have finally succumbed to the realization of their mortality. And that could be the fact they've got hours, yeah, days or weeks to live, and have actually resigned or surrendered to that level of awareness. And every single one of those, not those that are still fighting you know, the, the inevitable, you know, but those, those that have surrendered to that level of awareness and have a little more level of serenity around that rather than intrepidation, yeah, and, and obviously there's always fear you know, for a lot of people, but those that have come to the awareness and accepted it, not one person, yeah, and you can talk to nurses in hospices that, that spend their life around these people, not one person have I ever come across that has lied there and said, you know something, please go and fetch me my mahogany framed MBA certificate. <laughs> please go fetch me the keys to my Ferrari. No. What do they say? Every set, what is the grand prize? What's your the grand prize is please go and fetch me the people that I care about and I wish I told that I loved them more than I did. Or please go fetch me you know, the, the people I, I, I love uh, and I want to just want to be around, even if nothing is said, I can just be with them. That's the grand prize. And most people avoid that and miss the game completely because they're so busy chasing validation that they're good enough because they need you know, a, a financial bank account uh, to, to prove it in the eyes of others. You, know, you were born good enough. Get off that game. Once you're free of that game, yeah, and you can start recognizing that true fulfillment comes from yeah, love, joy, happiness, thinking happy thoughts, not getting caught up and stressed out because you, you, your, your Wi-Fi signal isn't strong enough, right? not, not getting caught up because McDonald's ran out of barbecue sauce. Right? But when you come from a place of, of surrender to the fact that what is the grand prize, guess what? You're then free to go and make money. But it doesn't have a hold over you. Yeah, and the paradox easier. is you'll probably make more of it yeah. because it won't mean as much. That is uh, incredibly deep and well said. And it makes me wonder, you get some pretty heavy criticism from your latest space energy project. And criticism <laughs> triggers those things, right? Uh, so so you are managing to to do something that is, is very much world changing. Uh, at the same time, how do you handle it internally when you get the critics? So, I mean, we can all see what you say to the critics and that, you know, you're, you're sticking with your science. Um, but how do you handle that internally? How do you keep them from taking you out of the zone? So, you know, you get out of the flow state, you get you, you get basically bummed because they are saying effectively you are not good enough as a part of the criticism. Uh, and you've never been called a crazy person, have you, Peter? I mean... Well, I hope so. <laughs> exactly. But so what, 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 tell me what goes on inside your mind or inside your heart when you know, someone says, oh my God, I have a you know, PhD from X, Y, and Z, and you know, Peter is a nutter, and it's never going to work, and it's you know, going to kill the planet, whatever, whatever the, the worst things <laughs> that they say. What does that do to you, and how do you turn that around? Here's a lesson in, uh, in 
in psychology that I, I think would offer some value and benefit to, to many of the, the, the listeners or viewers. People say to me, what is one of the biggest gifts you can give to children? And I, I would say that the first thing is to understand the difference between being internally and externally validated. If you are externally validated, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, you will need other people to agree with your model of the world in order to feel good about it. And the second somebody disagrees with that, you are on a defensive path to try and revalidate you know, your model of the world to them. Right? That's an exhausting game. I already said, you want the key to unhappiness? Try and get somebody else to, to agree with what it is you want them to agree with. That's a fool's game. That's Disneyland thinking, it's never gonna happen. Right? Seven billion people on the planet and seven different ways of looking at it. You know, seven billion different ways of looking at it. You know, it's like, it's, you know, I, 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 no way we're getting on with that. So if I hear somebody else's uh, opposing point of view, then yeah, it doesn't get me wrong. I'm not myopically glued to something because it's my idea and therefore it's right. No, if somebody presents a, a level of insight that I think is valid, that is an area I've not looked at, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, far, far, far from it. Yeah, then, and I think it's valid, I'll, I'll, of course I'll have a look at that. But for somebody to say that my model of the world challenges theirs and therefore mine's wrong, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, if you hear it from that perspective, you see the lunacy of it, right? Yeah. And you know, I, I'm very and exceptionally internally validated. Now, I don't need 6,999,999,999 other people to agree with me at any level for me to feel good about what it is that I want to feel good about. Why would I? If I'm not hurting anybody else, and if as long as nobody's less than because they crossed my path, why the hell would I subject myself to the good opinion of others? When I know that's a game no one can ever win. Now, I don't swim in goop. Yeah, G-O-O-P, good opinion of other people. Most people spend their life swimming in goop, right? Because they're externally validated. Do you want to give a gift to your kid? Get them to be internally validated, not to the point where they're arrogant. Arrogance is the same you know, pattern, just a flip side of the coin. Yeah, I'm indifferent to your stupid model of the world because mine's better. Yeah, I'm almost validating mine by proving yours is wrong. It's the same deal. No, that's not that. There's no humility in that. Right? My, I don't need, if someone's got a PhD, then for a start, I already know they've been programmed to be a mismatcher. <laughs> their, entire, their entire thesis is based upon proving something that hasn't been proved yet. They're conditioned to it. It's predictable. Yeah, you know, I remember when I was 22, I said, you know, when I get uh, as many hate websites as Bill Gates, I know I'll be doing well. <laughs> you know, it's just perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you are internally validated, yeah, not, not opinionated, not egotistical. Again, as I said, that's just the flip side of the coin to, to yeah, uh, be, being uh, externally validated. That, that's a case of, of you know, not giving a crap. Of course I care about other people's view, but if there's something valid there, then I'll assess it on my own terms, and, and if it's valid, I'll thank them for, for their perspective. But for someone to come out of left field and, and yeah, try and justify my world, I see the pattern they're running. It's the pattern I've just explained. Yep. They need, if it, if it contradicts their model of the world and they're externally validated, they have to contradict where I am uh, and try and get me to, and try and attack you know, mine and anyone else's point of view. It's how yeah. they get their validation. It's how they get their significance. It's because they feel not good enough, like you were saying earlier, right? So it's always there. It's always there. So I can feel almost, to be fair, amusement rather than <laughs> anger. Yeah, and that, that's not looking down on them. That's looking at the pattern, not them. You know, I, I make a distinction between somebody and somebody's behavior. That's an important distinction to make that only usually comes through a high level of awareness. You know, it certainly didn't come in any of my lower levels of awareness, I can tell you that. <laughs> you know? So I'm very fortunate and blessed that having had the, the level of discipline and self-inquiry on the journey that I've gone, and, you know, I'm, I'm only you know, a, a couple of steps ahead of, of, of people that haven't taken that based on experience that, again, I said earlier, people, you know, probably, you know, some people aren't, haven't had the fortune to, to have access to the level of insights I have. It's not some clever or special. But you know, to, to understand the distinction between somebody and their behavior is a very powerful level of insight to bring to the table. Yeah. Now, if somebody wants to attack me, right, if, I'm, if I'm at the same level of awareness, I'm gonna push back. But if I recognize that this person's having a bad day, this person is frustrated, this person you know, is obviously on their own journey, and, and thank God I'm not them, because you know, I, yeah. if I was to live my life with that level of stress, holy crap, I'm, I, I'm in awe of their ability to still function. 
Love and, it. And, and come from a place of admiration for where they're at rather than judgment and try and defend my position. That's a fool's game. Give me a break. So, yeah, am, am I going to get attacked? I hope so. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, does yeah. it contradict everybody else's model of the world? Well, it wouldn't be doing much good if it didn't. <laughs> I love yeah, it. You're not going to save the world thinking what everybody else thinks. <laughs> Give me... <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this is the only interview I've had so far, Peter, where I feel like the interview has already maybe answered the final question, but I'm going to ask the final question so you can just wrap it up succinctly. And this is something I've asked all 100 and about 20 people I've interviewed over the past few years. Given your entire life experience, your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better at whatever it is they're here to do, just most three important nuggets. Everybody always wants the, the top this, the top that, the golden this, the golden. <laughs> you see, like, one, of the first, one of the first things I would suggest is, is give up the need to, to look for the top three. You know? okay. uh, and, but inherent in that is to learn to live in the space of a question. Most people's minds are so conditioned to absolutes. And part of the reason for that is historically we're programmed to have a thirst for answers. You know, we grew up outside of the sciences as a species, as, as, uh, in, in a way that for, for generations and tens of thousands of years, we were intrigued by natural phenomena. You know, when it rained, we wondered why. Where, where did the ocean go every night? Why did it come back? You know, you know, uh, you know, well, why did the moon change shape? You know, we have an intrinsic built into our DNA thirst for, for absolute answers. And, and so the flip side to that on a positive, it makes man the consummate explorer to reach out beyond that comfortable grass and create magic that no other species or, or no other part of history of man has had the ability to do. But the other side to that is that the mind wants, yeah, give me the top three. So if you are able to, if I was to put, put the, the top one, yeah, having mm -hmm. contradicted what I just said, yeah, <laughs> I would say one of the, the most powerful things that somebody can do is to increase their ability to handle uncertainty. Ooh, great answer. All right. Yes. And inherent in that is learn to live in the space of the question. Right? The second thing I, I would encourage people to look at is to recognize that we all come at life through a different looking glasses. You know, you create your model of the world. I create my model of the world. Right? It's going to be different for you because you have a different way of interpreting through the five senses on top of a different belief system, a different upbringing, a different cultural paradigm, and, 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 and. So therefore, if you agree with me, then there's something wrong. It's like, you know, the, 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 the adage, um, in, if two people in business always agree, one of them's unnecessary. Okay. So, you know, learn to understand that we all have a different viewpoint and be okay with that. I don't need you to agree with me to me feel good about agreeing with myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make a distinction there because if you can do that, everything shifts. Right? And the, the the third one, if I, I was to, to 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 sum that up, let me have a think. Uh, uh, again, don't get hooked by your immediate circumstances. If you're bitching and complaining about the, the artifacts in the room in the museum right now, yeah, you're either going to get thrown out but you have, or you're going to be you know, more annoyed that you are never going to change them. Make a conscious choice to, to walk into a different room. Choose a different vector. Yeah? Say, so you know something? I, I can either complain about my current circumstances or I can choose the ones that I want. Get inspired. Yeah, tap into the an, an innate sense of who you are that was born a miracle. You know, 400 million to one and you show up. That was no accident. You chose to be here for a better reason than working nine to five in a job you don't like for somebody you've never probably you know, uh, understood for a, a wage that, you, that is less than what you're worth to retire at 65 on something that you thought might be happiness to find out it isn't. Right? Give it up. Right? Follow your passion, follow your bliss and don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Peter? Amazing interview. Thank you for taking the time to be on Bulletproof Executive Radio. Where should people go to learn more about what you're doing, your books? Give me your URL, Twitter, wherever else you'd like people to know more about what you're doing. Oh, th thank you. Um, there, well, my website, obviously, petersage.com. Uh, it, it's hard to hide a, a public profile these days, so if you Google Peter Sage, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere for, for the right or wrong reasons, I'm sure, depending on if you've got a PhD or not. <laughs> um, 
but uh, yeah, no, Twitter, Peter Sage 007. Um, uh, please you know, tweet away or, or retweet this or, or whatever. You know, my, my passion here is to, to get the you know, message out that can hopefully raise, even if it's one thing that people can take out of this kind of interview, that they can make a difference with. You know, knowing and not doing is the same as not knowing. Uh, and most people you know, are, are, are well read and know nothing. Uh, or they're inspired in the moment, but then get caught up in you know, trying to do too much. And the reason is that the emotional root is usually overwhelmed, leads to confusion, which leads to inaction, which means they learn so much, they do nothing. Take one thing out of this interview and, and, go, and go and help somebody else with it. Go be the example, go share it. Uh, and if you want access to more of my work, then yeah, I'm obviously on YouTube. Yeah, PeterSage.com is, is my main resource. And yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to spend this time with you and, uh, and, and have this chat and hopefully yeah, add some value to some people that are watching or listening. You absolutely did. Thanks, Peter.